person themselves is somebody that's in conversions. I happen to work on a board with them. It's how come I met them. They do not do these seminars anymore. It was as a favor to me that he's coming here. And that means it's a favor to you. Jordan Rubens, regarded by many as the most respected and beloved natural health expert in America. His personal account and triumph over Crohn's disease has resonated with millions of people. He has been given a gift by God. I call him like, a, like an Edison. He has been given a gift to create dynamic new formulations that I believe are going to continue to evolve and become like almost like pre-millennial revelations of technology. I'm going to play this great video that he's going to come out, but I want you to get on your feet when he comes out and let him know that you're glad he's here because Dr. Jordan Rubin is making a special trip just for this group. Play the video. And the sound makes it so much more effective. We don't have a convergence in every area. It's not level 10 everywhere yet. If you could hear it. The suspense is killing me. How many of you know who Dr. Jordan is? How many of you know you don't need a video in order to get ready for him? Jordan, are you ready to come out? Everybody stand up and give it up for Jordan Rubin! Thank you, brother. So good to see you. Thank you. You know what I love about this video technology we all live by? Constant Zooms, all of our Teams meetings. Whenever a video freezes, you always look like this. I don't know what it is. It's 100% of the time you are uh, looking like that. So I'm excited to be here. We're going to talk about how to live healthy to 100. And what's interesting is if I were to ask you how many of you want to live to 100 years of age? I'm not sure everyone would raise their hands. The reason being, I know 120, we'll get to that in a moment. The reason being is that when we picture a 100-year-old person, the first image that comes to mind is a tombstone because that is far greater than the average person in the world lives today. But if we know someone who's 100 or even 90 or even 85, we picture them frail, weak, etc. But what I love about what could be called the emerging science or the truth of longevity and anti-aging is that both the Bible and science are starting to line up, or as Lance would say, converge, which means that there is good data to support that our bodies were programmed to live 120 years of age. And we do know in the Bible that in an environment that's similar to ours, and what I mean by that is Adam and Eve, Methuselah, and others lived in a different environment to ours. That's for another seminar. But in an environment similar to ours, in a modern environment, men and women of God lived well over 100 years of age, and we're going to talk about that today. And what gives me the platform to share about how to live vibrant and healthy has less to do with what I've studied, less to do with what I've read or learned, and much more to do with what I've experienced. So um, 20, nearly 30 years ago, I was deathly ill with Crohn's disease and multiple other illnesses, 18 to be exact. I was at death's door and I was just turning 19 years of age. So frankly, I know what it's like to be a frail, deathly, trapped in a prison that was my own body type of a person. Now prior to that, I was extremely healthy, six feet tall, 185 pounds, 
committed my life to God. I was somebody who was very magnanimous, had a lot of friends, very loud, constantly talkative. But I literally became a shell of myself, visiting three medical experts over the course of two years, desperate for answers. And rather than give all of the details of this horrifying illness, I want to share one moment that I never get tired of speaking about, and it is so critical, not just to my story, but possibly yours, no matter where you're at today. During the course of my illness, multiple hospitalizations, multiple doctors telling me that I had the worst case of XYZ they'd ever seen, telling me that I would need a lifetime of medications, multiple surgeries, that I would likely have a difficulty having children. During this period of time, as a formerly invincible teenager, I realized that this illness was not like a cold or flu. It wasn't going to go away in a week. It completely changed my life. I had to medically withdraw from college where I was very happy to be at the time into my parents' home being taken care of like an infant. It was a horrifying two years of living hell. But during this period of time when I realized just how important your physical health is, because frankly, our body houses our soul and our spirit. But when our body dies, even though we are eternal beings, we are not here on this earth to fulfill God's purpose and calling for us. So I knew that health was critical. Most important thing we could have physically on this earth. And I knew that if God would heal me, that if I could just get well and help one person overcome disease or better yet avoid it, then this living hell will have all been worth it. You know, it's interesting. People ask, Jordan, did you come to know God during your illness? Because some people do, right? You come to a low point and you cry out for God and you meet God. I knew God. I lived for God. But during this two-year period, I gained more perspective, maybe more of a mature perspective. And I understood that God doesn't just expect things from us when we're wealthy, healthy, and wise. I had every excuse in the world. I could barely walk. I would often faint and black out. My iron level in my blood was zero. There are corpses that have better iron levels than I had. But as a friend of mine was reading a passage of Scripture to me because my eye muscles were too weak to even read, one of my favorite verses of all time popped off the page, and that's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, faith is the substance or bedrock foundation of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The passage goes on to read, without faith it is impossible to please God. See, he has an expectation of you, and it doesn't say without faith it is impossible to please God as long as you're in the position you want to be today. It just says without faith it is impossible to please God. Now you see in Romans, faith comes by hearing the word of God, and in James, faith without action or works is dead, invalid, impotent. So here I was, bedridden, I didn't smile, I didn't laugh, all my life was about was visiting doctors, suffering from a very embarrassing, horrible disease, I didn't want friends to visit me, when I was out in public, which was rare, people were not drawn to me, they were repulsed by me, because I looked like someone that had something you didn't want to catch, if it were contagious. So what could I do that would marry my faith, which was small, with action? So in this room that I would stay in, <clears throat> seven steps away was a bathroom and then a closet, and that's where I would walk well too many times during the day. And often, I wouldn't make it because I had so little energy, so little life, so little vitality. But one day I walked there and I 
yelled to my mom. Now, I usually tell young people, um, I called for my mom to get a camera, and not a phone, a camera. And I said, Mom, come in here. And I'm standing there with my boxer shorts on, as you can see in the picture, and nothing else. I didn't have a beard because it was fashionable. I couldn't afford to lose any blood, and I didn't have the strength to really shave. So I said, Mom, come here. She said, what? And I said, I want you to take my picture. She said, Jordan, it breaks my heart to look at you. I don't want to take your picture. And I said, Mom, you need to take my picture. She said, Jordan, can't we wait till you're better? And I said, Mom, you need to take my picture. I wasn't so insistent because my voice was probably weaker, but I said, take the picture, Mom. She said, why? And I said, because the world's not going to believe what God's about to do in my life. And to be honest, it was the only faithful moment I probably would have in a month period of time. And it was the gift of faith that God gave me. She took the picture, and that moment, that instant of faith, allowed me to have a platform that defies education, defies degrees, diplomas, and position. Some of the greatest testimonies in the world, certainly in the Bible, don't involve fantastic and precise theology. They involve power, according to Revelation, of our testimony and our word and the blood of the Lamb. And so no matter where I would go the next 30, almost 30 years, people might not agree with my dietary advice or might not like what I've written in health books or what I say during interviews or seminars. But what they can't deny, just like the blind man who was born blind, who didn't know much about the man that healed him, all he knew is once I was blind and now I see. That's my testimony. Once I was dying and now I'm very much alive. And my goal or my purpose has been to help other people follow suit. I said helping people overcome disease was a passion of mine. Helping them avoid it is even a greater one. I have once heard that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and the only 100% assurance you have of overcoming a disease is never being diagnosed with one. And my journey and what God would take me through would seem to spawn organizations, companies, products, books, and solutions. I've asked God repeatedly, and I will again, that I want to write a book or start a company in the future based on someone else's testimony, not mine. I love the resurrection. I don't like the death. I love the healing. I don't like the sickness. I love the prosperity. I don't like the brokenness and the bankruptcy, right? But my testimonies continued to build, and as you can see, um, Crohn's disease wasn't the only C word that I had battled. And God had taught me a lot in the ensuing 13 or so, 14 years. But even though I had already written a book on overcoming cancer naturally, I was diagnosed with cancer in 2008, but not just any cancer, the kind that the oncologist said that if I don't get conventional treatment, there is a 100% chance that I'm going to die. Now, in my mind, I thought, could I get like 97? I mean, first of all, 5% is horrible. 1% is pretty bad. 100% was so bad that I instantly knew this was a testimonial in the making because how ridiculous that a human being could tell another human being there's a 100% chance you're going to die if you don't get surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. It, it makes no sense. But it makes for a great testimonial. And I'm not going to go into great detail about this particular part of my life, but I will say this. The same way Hebrews 11 verse 1 was critical to my healing when diagnosed with Crohn's disease and 18 other illnesses, when I learned that the oncologist was going to give me a bad report, before he even said it, he made a comment saying upon giving me my prognosis that there's more to discuss. So if you have a health challenge and the doctor says there's more to discuss, 
that additional information is never good news. So as he walked out to bring results of my CT scan, I asked my wife Nikki to stand in front of the door, and I did what I've done probably eight times in my life. I got on my hands and knees, yes, in the doctor's office, and I quoted from Job. I said, blessed are you, Lord, for you give and you take away. And you know, there's good argument to say that God didn't take anything away from Job. It was the enemy. But you know what? I wanted to quote that verse because it's a sign of submission. I've done this many times in my life when I had the wind knocked out of me, when I feel like I lost something great or dear to me, when I felt like I couldn't breathe. And what I do is quote Job 121. You know, we talk about prayers, and I love the prayer of Jabez that God would expand our territory, that He wouldn't bring us harm. But when you are devastated and you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, it may make sense to just submit, drop to your knees, and say, it is the Lord who gives, it is the Lord who takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He created you, He loves you, and so I did that. And over the course of time, uh, while we were attempted to be manipulated and scared into a certain course of treatment, telling the doctor that the Lord was going to heal me, but later claiming that the Lord had healed me, I just needed to wait and see it manifest. And in my waiting, by the way, it was 40 days of 12 to 14 hours of body, mind, soul, and spirit therapies, a complete unplugging of work, which hasn't happened before or since, and telling a small circle of people that God had healed me, and you're going to see it. People that were believers, people that were non-believers. God worked a miracle, and I could tell you a great story of when I learned about my cancer-free prognosis. By the way, I had to fire my oncologist. I had to chart a course with just me and God, which was difficult. And I'm not saying everybody's cut out for that, but the Lord had prepared me for it. It was an amazing time to receive God's healing again. And with that healing, I received a new passion. And by the way, when I talk about passion for helping sick people, it's not a passion like someone would have for their favorite college football team. It's a knowing passion, but it's the kind of passion that I wish someone with cancer would go to any other route than come to me because it is an emotionally challenging, somewhat brutal experience to be counted on to help someone go against conventional wisdom or what they call conventional wisdom and guide somebody through that journey. And I very much need to know God wants me to do it. But even before I started sharing my journey of overcoming cancer, conquering cancer. God began to bring people to me that had cancer. And it was so interesting because I would share with them the emotional and spiritual battle that cancer involves. I'm confident it's a spiritual disease, and I can talk about that in the future. They would say, Jordan, it's amazing. How do you know this? You have so much empathy for me. It's almost like you've been there. But the Lord had me keep this under wraps a bit although he did plant a seed for a book that I will one day write, it hasn't happened yet, but it will, called To Hell With Cancer. So just remember that one. Don't steal the title, just remember it. And God ultimately revealed to me many, many things that can attack and conquer this demonic disease. And hear me say that because I am 100% convinced that, I'm going to use the word convergence again in this way, in a negative, cancer is a convergence of the demonic. Physical, yes, but when I meet somebody who's been diagnosed with cancer, I usually know if they're going to conquer or if they're going to die by what they say, how they are acting, and what their words are. And I'll, I'll end this portion here by saying, if you've been diagnosed with cancer, if you're near bankruptcy, if your relationship with your spouse is more than on the rocks, but over the cliff, headed towards the rocks. If your child has left, abandoned you and abandoned God, 
If you spend a thousand words more saying that I'm going to go broke, I'm going to lose my wife, I'm going to die, my child's never going to amount to anything, rather than confessing God's promises, no matter how ridiculous they may sound to you or other people, you're going to get exactly what you want. Now, I grew up, I'm Jewish, but I grew up with a hodgepodge of Messianic Judaism, charismatic churches, but ultimately came to a relationship with God in a Baptist church. And we used to pray, Lord, if it's your will to heal. When I was diagnosed with cancer, I quickly realized the teachings of Scripture, of people that were men and women of greater faith, Charles Capps, etc. I wrote a prayer that is about four minutes long. I quoted it three times a day, and I felt like when I did the demons and the devil were holding their ears like a dog whistle blown to a dog. In the midst of 12 to 14 hours a day of, quote, treatment to overcome cancer, when someone would bring up the fact that I had cancer, I didn't even realize it was me. I didn't own it. I didn't wear it. How dare we say something like, I am a diabetic? And by the way, I'm not trying to be critical. How dare we say, my son is autistic? How can we say, I am a cancer survivor? I am going through cancer. You know, there's a real problem with the I am's because that's the only name that God ever said you should call him. And I can promise you, he is not a diabetic. He is not autistic and he is not a cancer anything. And I come from a Jewish family and certain ethnicities like Jewish families can be very negative. Lance would love this. Um, I grew up learning a lot of Yiddish, which is a combination of Polish, German, and just a bunch of made-up stuff, I'm convinced. <laughs> it's a very negative type of language, and in fact, the best thing you can say, at least what I heard in a Jewish family, would be something neutral, not even good, but every time you did, you'd have to say something like kinahura poo poo, which is like knocking on wood and spitting, and it's a stupid superstition. But just to give you an idea of how negative Jewish people can be, particularly when they speak the Yiddish language, there are 13 words to describe a jerk who's a guy, and one word to describe a good guy, and it's mensch, and all it means is man. You know, he's a real mensch. Meanwhile, there's so many ways to describe a man who falls short, some of which were in the a prelude to Laverne and Shirley, which if I was speaking to young people, they would have no idea what I'm talking about. Shlemiel, Shlemazel, Shmegegi, Stunk, Schmendrick. There's worse that I'm not going to talk about. So for me, growing up, it's always, if you say anything good, you have to put a caveat with knocking on something or spitting. But I learned to speak positive. I remember when I was ill, there was, with Crohn's disease, I was working with a man who helped me understand God's plan for my health. And he asked why I'm always frowning. And I said, well, in Yiddish, they call that ungeblusen. That means you have a frown. And so he basically said, well, we're not going to be ungeblusen anymore. We're going to speak life. This is an entire message into, of its, into itself, but I'm going to promise you we'll get practical here. But the point is, whatever you're dealing with today, and I believe this word is for many of you, and, and I feel pray, fall prey to it as well. We all do. But we have to speak what we want, particularly if it aligns with God's word. And as a Baptist church member growing up and really sitting under amazing teaching, I was warned to avoid faith preachers or name it and claim it. I remember there was a Kenneth Copeland conference in my area, and we were like warned to stay away from there. I would later become friends with the Copelands and um, had to apologize, but, <laughs> but here's what I'll say. The name it and claim it message is 100% true. Here's why. Here's why. I met several people who said they were going to die from cancer, and they did. 
I met several people who said they were going to lose their marriage and it happened. I met several people that said they were going to go broke and they lost everything. And I've met several people that said, my child is never going to X, Y, Z, and they never did. So it's really important how we speak, what we believe. We know that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, but there's something powerful about your words that can change your heart. Because I can promise you that there were times when I would say I was healed of cancer, but the blood work showed something different, the scans showed something different, and the horribly bedside manner doctor at Harvard Medical didn't. But it's a way for us to reverse some level of gravitational pull that this earth has, which seems to pull us towards everything we don't want. Because the person who is roaming the air, known as the prince of the air, wants exactly the opposite for our lives as we want. All right, so let's fast forward from my life to your life. How do we live healthy to 100? First, let me give you a few examples. This is really important, and you, you all know this. Moses lived to 120 years of age. Moses walked up to the mountain and had a glimpse of what God previously wanted him to experience, but now would only let him see. And at 120 years of age, and there's different translations, but when Moses died, his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Can anyone guess what natural force means in the Hebrew? You're right. It's natural force, meaning, get this, Moses could have fathered a child at 120 years of age. That's really living, right? The reason they talked about his eye is because the high priest would diagnose diseases based on your eyes. You could see that in the Torah. 120 years. And he wasn't the only one that lived this long. Aaron lived even longer. Sarah lived longer. And again, I'm talking about this modern post-Noahic, post-flood environment, which we're still a part of. We do a great job of trying to destroy our environment, by the way, but it's a similar environment that Moses lived in. Lance made reference to Caleb. I'm not exactly sure he looked like that at 85, but man, that's pretty awesome. He doesn't even use just for men for his beard. <laughs> Caleb was one of 12 spies that was told to go to the promised land, and Ten of them were scared to death, but Caleb said, I'm just as strong today as I was then, 45 years ago, and I can still fight as well in battle. Folks, you know what I do every morning, among other things? I have a prayer for my life that's a bunch of biblical promises and declarations, and it's a living document. I add to it because I read through the Bible sequentially multiple times a year, and one thing that I say is, like Moses, at 120 years of age, my eyes will not be dim, and my strength will be with me. And I also say, like Caleb, I will be stronger at 85 years of age than I was at 40 years of age. And you know what I did at 40 years of age? I tried to become as strong as I could so that at 85 I could be even stronger and have a high mark to achieve. I start every day with a declaration of what I want and what God's promised me so that when I forget it later in the day, I've already deposited these declarations in the bank. But listen, words are powerful, but actions must be married to words. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next 30 or so minutes, practical information about how you can live healthy to 100, more importantly, how you can start living healthy tomorrow. And here's the first one, build muscle. Now, the people who created my slides found someone holding a dumbbell. And most of you or some of you will say, well, I don't want to do dumbbell curls. I don't want to lift weights. But here's what I need you to understand. One of the main determining factors of your longevity is your strength and your muscle. I know that's bad news for some of you today, but the good news is you can build muscle at any age. 
The bad news is if you don't work at it, you will lose on average 7 to 8 percent of muscle every decade after 40, and between 70 and 80, you'll lose 15 percent, which means at 80, you'll be 39 percent weaker. Think about this. When you shake somebody's hand who's older, a lot of times it's cold and sort of clammy, a little bit like Swiss cheese. But when you meet someone who has a strong grip, male or female, 70, 80 years of age, doesn't that sort of spark you? I have a good friend named Don Finto, who some of you have heard of. He's a 93-year-old pastor who is, frankly, one of my heroes. He's like my grandfather. I don't have a natural grandfather anymore, but I love this man. But he is, goes to Israel, ministers in the Middle East, exercises, eats healthy, and is 93 years of age. So amazing. And he has a strong grip. Walks upright and still preaches behind a pulpit. And he believes the two reasons why he's strong and healthy. Number one, he blesses Israel, and God promises, therefore, to bless him. And number two, he lives a life that would honor the temple of the Holy Spirit that God calls our body in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Muscle is very important. In fact, if you say, well, Jordan, what are some ways that I know how I'm tracking? I mean, you can certainly understand and test the amount of muscle you have through something called the DEXA scan or other equipment. Simply look at your grip strength, how long can you hang from a position like what would normally be a pull-up that you may not dare to attempt? Or even something like a kneeling squat. These are ways, believe it or not, that are now correlated to our longevity. The more muscle you have at every decade of your life, the more healthy you will be. So how do we avoid what causes us to lose muscle and make conscious decisions to build it. Here's three activities. Walking. Now, some of you say, well, walking's no big deal. Walking's really good. It does help you build and maintain skeletal muscle because even though you're walking horizontally, you're still working against gravity, as long as you're on this planet, that is. Here's a big one. Weightlifting and resistance training. Now, this might be scary to some people, but men and women need to do this. Whether it's quote-unquote body weight exercises, Olympic-style weightlifting, using bands, swimming slash using those styrofoam things under the water, you need to practice resistance training. You need to load your muscles against gravity. Again, it could be as simple as a push-up or a counter push-up or a wall push-up a squat, or just get up and down from your chair. You know what simple way to do it? A lot of us like to watch programs that have commercials. Yes, they still have commercials. We pay for a service that we could watch sports games, and they still have commercials. But I decided I'm going to do push-ups during every commercial, and I realized not only do I hate commercials, <laughs> I really hate commercials, because it's amazing how many push-ups you'll do during one hour of a program that has commercials you got to do something. And people say, well, I don't have time or I don't want to go to the gym. You don't have to, but do something for five minutes because it's five minutes better than nothing. And I promise you, if you don't, you will be 39% weaker at age 80. But there is research that shows 80-year-olds can build, not only maintain, but build muscle. All right, here's a good one, sprinting. I don't know about you, but as I mature and I'm nearing 50, my kids often tell me in words and actions that I'm not as cool as I think I am. I'm not as strong as they are. And I wish this was only my 19-year-old son who plays college football. It's my 16-year-old daughter who is confident she's stronger than me. And I am nowhere near as fast as them. Now listen, some of you may not have sprinted in decades. Start by walking, but if you will run as fast as you can, it's way better than running long distances slowly. In fact, that's not even good for you. There's no reason that our body was built to jog, but I can tell you we were built to run. 
Just ask somebody who's in Glacier National Park and hears the sounds of a grizzly bear. <laughs> we were made to run at times. Try to work up to sprinting. As silly as you feel and as silly as it looks, it is a great way to build muscle. How do I know this? Well, if you ever look at a marathon runner, they look sick and weak, but look at a sprinter and they are like the David statue, right? I mean, they're in great shape. Here are foods to avoid if you want to build muscle. Number one, soy. Soy, which was a huge craze back in the health food days. I remember growing up to hippie health nut parents, worked at health food stores. I started health companies. Soy was so popular back in the day, they would make soy-based ink, wallpaper, and the worst Thanksgiving meal ever, a tofurkey, which was a turkey made out of tofu. First of all, if something sounds that bad, there's no way you should be eating it. Which does bring me to an interesting point back to the Yiddish Jewish upbringing. There are certain culinary delights of various ethnic groups that sound really appetizing. Would you agree that Italian food sounds really good, like rigatoni, tortellini, everything's exciting. Everything that you make in the Jewish language ends in ugh. <laughs> I'm serious, and here's one that you're supposed to actually think is good. Kreplach. It's frankly nearly two words that both sound awful. Oh, but don't worry, there's a dessert that's called rugalach as if that sounds at all appetizing. <laughs> Soy is challenging for men and women primarily because it disrupts your hormones, thyroid hormones, providing plant-based estrogens which block testosterone. You don't want to consume soy ingredients even though they're everywhere. Soy oil, soy lecithin are not quite as bad, but they're still not good. Soy protein is what you want to avoid. Years ago, they told us to have 25 grams a day. I believe that it has led to feminization of men and over estrogen dominance in women. So we want to avoid that. Foods with added sugar. I don't love what the USDA often decides to do or the FDA, but one good rule is that foods need to list added sugars. So you know the difference between if you had apples that were cut up and put in a package that had naturally occurring sugars versus added sugars. You want to try to avoid excess added sugars. Now there are sweeteners that I like and God likes. I don't want to argue with God when he says honeycomb is good for the bones. Or when he talks about honey reviving Jonathan when he was at war. So honey is good, particularly if it's raw and unheated, not if it comes in the carcass of a lion. I just added that because <laughs> I wanted to make you think I knew the Bible really well. <laughs> Processed vegetable oils. We've been talking about this for years. You might hear the term seed oils. These are highly processed. It takes a lot to get an oil from a seed. It doesn't take so much effort to get oil from olives or fat from butter, both of which are talked about in the Bible, by the way. Avoid these foods. Now here, this is interesting. I didn't want to simply put just ordinary foods that you could use to build muscle. I wanted to give you something interesting that you may not hear all the time. But number one, folks, red meat is good for you. I'm going to say that again. Red meat is good for you. But I'm going to tell you why, and this is part of an upcoming message that I'm going to share, and I'll give you a sneak peek. I believe red meat is good because it contains protein, vitamin B12, B6, zinc. I believe red meat is good because it contains amino acids such as creatine and carnitine and carnosine and anserine. Many you haven't heard of, they're non-essential amino acids, but really good for you. But here's the real reason I believe red meat is good, and you can't convince me otherwise. I believe in the Bible. And I'm going to say something pretty bold. If you believe in the Bible, and you believe it's God's Word, and you believe red meat is bad, you don't believe God's Word. Can I tell you why? Who's the wisest man that ever lived according to God? 
Now, we all know Solomon may not have ended as well as he started. In fact, he ended terribly. But Solomon asked for wisdom. God granted it in a dream, actually, and he said Solomon was the wisest man in the world. If Solomon was the wisest man in the world and people marveled at what he understood, including animals, science, physiology, anatomy, if Solomon consumed a meal every day, could you think that it would be the healthiest meal in the world? If Solomon knew more about animals and even named some animals, finished up the work that Adam started, that's what the Bible says, Solomon in Kings had a certain meal every single day that was brought to him and all of his fellow diners. Whoever dined with Solomon enjoyed all kinds of red meat, stall-fed cattle, grass-fed cattle, deer, roebucks, which is like an elk, some poultry, and yes, meal and flour. So I'm going to blow you away and say that grains are good for you too in certain forms. The Solomon meal is primarily red meat and grains. Guess what? Pretty much every group of diet espousing folks say not to eat one or the other. Don't eat red meat or don't eat grain. Nobody says to eat both other than the Bible. You know what's sad? The Christian Medical and Dental Association says to minimize or avoid red meat, among other things they say, but it's time we actually believed the Bible. Really. I don't even have to tell you the research that disproves that a plant-based diet is better than an omnivorous diet. There's lots of it. But all I'm going to say to this group is that God clearly gave Solomon the wisdom to know what was good for him to eat. And you know what's crazy? This is probably the first time you even heard that Solomon had a meal, much less it's what he ate every single evening. The truth is Solomon was the wealthiest man in the world, and he ate red meat. Why? Because he could afford it. And so did every other people group on the planet. Those that don't eat meat, it's because they can't get it, can't find it, or can't afford it. Is there better sources of meat than others? Absolutely. I have two farms. We raise the best meat in the world. It's a passion of mine, but red meat is something we should not avoid. It is the muscle of an animal, and when you eat the muscle of an animal, no, it kind of sounds a little bad now that I mention it, you are what you eat. And all ancient systems of health believe that. If you eat liver, it's going to help your liver. If you eat muscle, it's going to build muscle. And this is muscle. Number two, pomegranates. I chose this not just because it is the biblical fruit. If you didn't know this, a pomegranate has an average of 613 seeds in it. That's the exact number of laws, commandments in the Old Testament. How amazing is that? It was the royal fruit. I say was because you may not know this, but the national fruit in Israel is now the nopal cactus or the prickly pear. I don't know when it changed, but they call that the sabra fruit. We grow pomegranates and we grow prickly pear. Pomegranates have a compound called elagic acid. I'm not going to give you a quiz on all of this later, but elagic acid is converted by the body into a substance called urolithin A and B and C. And urolithin is a compound, a metabolite that the body creates from pomegranate and raspberries and walnuts and others to help you have muscle health. Eat pomegranates and it's got other good things in it as well. Watermelon. I have a son who could live on watermelon Watermelon contains an amino acid called citrulline. Citrulline helps create nitric oxide in the body, which is a vasodilator and makes your arteries expand and run clean and gives blood flow to your muscles. Watermelon's a great pre or mid workout, and it has loads of potassium, 
which we're mostly deficient in because we don't eat potassium-rich foods very often. Red meat, pomegranate, watermelon, what's the common denominator? They're all red. That's not the point here, but these are just three of the many things you can eat to build muscle. Protein, by the way, is very important. It comes from the Latin word proteus, which means of primary importance or that which comes first. Your meals should focus on protein. But there are people that say you should eat all starches, all vegetables. They talk about peasants eating all of those. Exactly. Do you want to eat like a peasant or you want to eat like a king? If you want to eat like a king, look what Solomon ate. Oh, and by the way, Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14 tells you what meats you should and shouldn't eat according to Scripture. That's not the Old Testament. There's more revelation in the Tanakh or the original covenant that you and I can ever understand. So let's stop calling it old. Let's call it ancient maybe, but it's ancient wisdom. And God wouldn't waste His words on meat if you were supposed to avoid it. By the way, I know approximately what Adam and Eve ate in the garden. I know that sounds like a crazy statement, but I can explain it another time. Yes, it was an all plant-based diet, but I promise you it wasn't carrots, spinach, and kale. Again, I'll have to save that for another time, but God has revealed so much to me about how we should eat and live just simply by me asking. It's not much else. What did Solomon do to get wisdom? He asked for it, and I ask for it every single day. Supplements. I do believe in supplements, but supplements do not replace a healthy diet. They are in addition to a healthy diet. Because you will not eat liver, heart, and kidney. By the way, there's lots of Jewish words for what we used to eat in terms of organ meats, just like there's Scottish words, haggis, just like there are other words that we use in England, English, like tripe, etc., Organ meats used to be a part of our daily diet. They're not anymore. They are the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. If you can't or won't eat organs, you should consume supplemental organs. It is, without a doubt, the most important superfood category on the planet. B vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins such as A and D, E and K, it gives you the greatest amount of nutrition. By the way, every native culture that hunts an animal eats the organs first. I don't know how relevant this is, but it's kind of cool. When a orca kills a shark, it eats the liver only. When a predator animal, like a lion or any other large cat, kills some type of antelope, deer, water buffalo, they eat the organs first. Native Americans eat the organs first. Aboriginal Australians, New Zealanders, they eat the organs first. You wonder why your mother and grandmother had liver and onions every week? Because we needed to eat it. Someone clapped about liver. That's amazing. <laughs> Herbs can help you build muscle. I'm going to give you three. Two you've never heard of. One you may have. Number one, Indian globe thistle. Considered a weed by some, Indian globe thistle helps your muscles maintain and gain strength. Mango bark. Now, this has been used for thousands of years, primarily in India and the Middle East. Mango bark helps build muscle. And the third, which you may have heard of, ashwagandha, which means in the Indian language, the smell of a horse. But why does it mean that? doesn't smell great, but it means that because of the vigor that it brings for men and for women. <clears throat> These herbs also help you sleep. They give you energy, etc. And amino acids, I already mentioned this. We know, or we should, that there are essential amino acids, and there's non-essential amino acids. Some of the non-essential amino acids I mentioned, such as creatine, which is found primarily in red meat, good for muscles, now good for the brain, they believe, Carnitine, which is an amino acid that's good for the heart muscle, and citrulline, which I mentioned, found in watermelon, etc., is good for bringing blood flow to your body, including your extremities, which helps you exercise more and with greater efficiency. All right, so that's how we build muscle. Get out and do it. 
Now we want to talk about collagen. Now this is interesting. Collagen, we may have heard of watching advertisements for skin creams. Collagen is the protein that holds us together. It's the glue. It makes up our skin, hair, nails, joints, ligaments, tendons, and most of our bones. There's more collagen in your bones than calcium. We need to preserve collagen. I believe collagen or connective tissue breakdown is the reason why athletes and normal folks have so many injuries today. How many of you are sports fans in the room? You can raise your hand. I use a lot of sports analogies. I'm going to use less for this audience. You have much better things to do than watching sports. My wife will tell you that. However, I grew up a huge sports fan. And I have seen over the ensuing decades more injuries by a factor of probably a hundred. There's a surgery that baseball players, primarily pitchers, get called Tommy John surgery. I got to know Tommy John a little bit before he died. The reason they named the surgery after a pitcher for the Yankees and a few other teams is that he had a ligament in his elbow that was torn and they replaced it. It's called a UCL or ulnar collateral ligament. Tommy John was the first to ever get it and I estimate when I was younger one out of a thousand pitchers had Tommy John surgery. Today one out of two pitchers has Tommy John surgery. I have a very good friend whose son in high school had Tommy John surgery. The most famous baseball player in the world who's Japanese named Shohei Otani has had two Tommy John surgeries and he's not 30 years of age. More Achilles tears, knee injuries, they call them non-contact injuries. You're running on a turf field and you blow out your knee. You're not getting tackled. The reasons that we have issues with our joints, ligaments, and tendons are twofold. Our collagen is not intact, and antibiotic overuse damages tendons, ligaments, etc. Not just taking antibiotics, but in our food supply. We need stronger connective tissue. When you were younger, or your parents or grandparents were younger, they consumed bone broth, chicken soup, beef soup. They never threw any part of the animal away, and we are a brothless generation. We need connective tissue proteins. We get less than 1% of those, and we get plenty of protein from other sources that don't support your collagen. I love saying this, if you can build muscle and preserve collagen, you can stop the sag. When your face sags, it's because of a loss of muscle and collagen. When you wave to somebody and your underarm is waving the other way, that's a loss of muscle and connective tissue. When you turn around or look in a mirror, basically your back to your heel is a straight line, you've lost connective tissue. We call that in our family flat tushy syndrome. And a lot of us deal with that, but you don't have to. Stop the sag, preserve collagen. How do we do it? Walking again. This is a good one, earthing or grounding. Folks, this sounds kind of weird and new age, but the bottom line is we need to connect with the earth. And if you want to de-stress, go outside with your bare tootsies and walk on the grass, walk on the beach. It is studied and proven to reduce cortisol. And what is cortisol? A hormone that, among other things, hastens collagen breakdown. And number three, heat exposure. I'm absolutely a sauna nut. When I gave Nikki her engagement ring, and shortly after we were married, I said, I don't think only women should get an expensive gift. She said, what do you have in mind? A necklace or a watch? No, I'd like a sauna in the house. We had a small apartment, didn't have a lot of spare room, but the sauna has become my prayer closet, it's become my sanctuary, and Heat exposure is a way to provide what is called hormetic stress, which allows your body not only to 
work on its cooling mechanisms, not only drive circulation, not only enhance your mental health, but it helps preserve collagen. I go in the sauna almost every day. My excuse is I can't shave without it. Everywhere I live or have lived, I have a sauna. And it's absolutely awesome. And some good friends of ours have a business where they're here and they have sauna therapy and cold exposure, which I'm a lot worse at that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But you need to subject your body to heat. As we age, our ability to adapt to stressors like heat and cold gets worse. We need to continue to fight that heat exposure. It could be sauna. It could be laying out in the warm sunshine or getting your body revved up through exercise, but heat exposure is important. I got a boogie here. Foods to avoid. Soda, for so many reasons, but even carbonation in soda and the acids in soda can break down your connective tissue, particularly your bones. My wife grew up in Kentucky. She wasn't the healthiest eater when we met, but she said when I was in school, they put a nail in a Coke and it rusted and I stopped drinking Coke, so that's good. Grains. Grains in large amounts can block mineral absorption, which hinders cartilage and collagen production. And number three, once again, processed vegetable oils. They contain omega-6 fats with drive inflammation, which can degrade collagen. Foods to eat. Bone broth, chicken soup. Make it yourself. Buy it at a store. They now have bone broth at almost every store. It's a craze. It's a superfood. Ground meat as opposed to steak because ground meat actually contains more collagen. And tart or low sugar citrus. Lemons, limes, grapefruit. Are oranges good? Sure, but they are bred to have so much more sugar today. Vitamin C rich fruits and vegetables help build collagen. Here's a great trivia answer for you to make you sound smart in the areas of health. Vitamin C is called vitamin C because it's the collagen vitamin. Pretty cool if you didn't know that. Supplements to consume. Collagen protein or peptides. You can get it easily. You can mix it in your coffee, your juice, your smoothies. I make my wife a coffee drink every morning and I put collagen protein in it. Everybody should be consuming, in my estimation, 30 to 50 grams of collagen a day to balance the other proteins you eat. It is critical. And then vitamin C I mentioned, the collagen building vitamin. This is going to really ring true to all of us because I see we have a mature audience here. I have learned, by the way, as I began speaking, even at a young age in my 20s, I always substitute mature for anything that resembles old. It makes people feel better. If I said we have a bunch of old folks in here, that's not going to be as warmly received. We need to boost our brain, and this does not just go for us mature people, folks. We have more neurodegeneration at an older age and more brain issues in our children than we ever have before. How do we boost our brain? Surprise! Resistance training! Believe it or not, resistance training stimulates chemicals that help promote longevity. By the way, hormones like testosterone and growth hormone that are great for the brain. Testosterone is one of the most important hormones for the brain. Number two, cold exposure. This is a major brain boost because staying in the cold, which I am terrible at, I'm working on it. I grew up in South Florida, so living in Tennessee and a little bit in Alabama now doesn't really help even though there's snow on the ground in Tennessee. Cold exposure is one of the greatest mental tests you can undergo. Cold plunging, ice baths, they are exploding. It used to be those weird polar bear people that would go in the water, but now it is amazing and it is an absolute brain game for you to withstand that level of cold through breathing and just a fight 
in your mental and your physical. By the way, if you don't want to go the cold plunge route, you can do a cold shower alternating with a hot shower. Start to turn the shower for as long as you can, as cold as you can. Even if it's at the end, you've got to shock your body with cold because it sends blood flow, nutrients, and immune system cells everywhere. But most of all, it builds your brain. And they're showing more and more data on cold exposure and heat exposure in its ability to boost your brain. Brain games. Challenge yourself. We need to boost our brain through reading, through solving problems. Everyone who has a device can find brain games and they're proven to work. Foods to eat. Egg yolks. Egg yolks have the greatest nutrition for the brain, including compounds such as phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, fat-soluble vitamins. Egg yolks are awesome. Why do you think we threw away our yolks and ate all egg whites in the early 90s? Because somebody is trying to kill us. You know what kind of omelet I like? An egg yolk omelet. Eggs are good for you, but all the nutrients other than protein, and there's some in there, are in the yolks. Dark berries, they have anthocyanins. Any dark berry, blueberry, blackberry, raspberry, strawberry can help build the brain. There's great data on that. And wild fatty fish, mackerel, salmon, herring, or good old-fashioned poor man's lobster sardines. It's, no one even calls it poor man's lobster. I just made that up. It's the cheapest, probably best food you can buy for a dollar whatever. And if anyone tells you they can't eat healthy on a budget, they just don't want to eat sardines. But they're loaded with all kinds of nutrients. Foods to avoid. Concentrated sugars. Artificial sweeteners in pink, yellow, and blue packets. The reason that people love them is you can say diet on your Coke, but if you remove the tea, imagine how many people would drink that. Marketing is powerful. Artificial sweeteners can cause all manner of neurodegeneration. They are bad. Hydrogenated oils, anything that says partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated, not good at all. Damaging to your brain through oxidation. Supplements. A mushroom called lion's mane is one of the most popular brain supplements or foods in the world. Organs again, surprise, loaded with B vitamins and fat-soluble vitamins. And blue-green algae, things called spirulina, chlorella, they contain a compound called phycocyanin, which is great for the brain. There's others including astaxanthin, which is found in salmon. It makes it red, and it makes flamingos pink. That's another trivia question. Folks, I started a company with my friend and colleague, Dr. Josh Axe, called Ancient Nutrition. We provide content, and we provide products so that you can get your collagen, your organs, your Indian globe thistle, and things that you don't know where to find. We created two pack multiple packages, men's and women's, just for this conference, there's gold, silver, and bronze, men's, women's. Here's what's great about this. Wow, there's all kinds of things flipping up on my screen. Okay, we have a table here with our awesome team. Folks, we have a great discount, and best of all, part of the proceeds go to support Lance Wall now and his ministries and his efforts there's a great low price for conference only, but let me tell you this. We don't have product to give you. We will ship the product free. Place the order at the table, and if you are watching via live stream, you can visit ancientnutrition.com forward slash Lance. Am I right about that? It's forward slash Lance. That's confirmed. Ancientnutrition.com forward slash Lance. And any of your questions about citrulline, creatine, or phycocyanin, you can direct to Lance personally. Uh, he will tell you all about that in his new plan to be super healthy. Folks, I want to encourage you to take some steps and walk out your health in your life. God can't use dead people. I should write a book entitled that. It could mean a lot of things, right? But 
This idea that a pastor does a funeral and says it must have been his time to go or it must have been her time to go, I'm way more interested in when it's his time to go. Because if it was my time to go, I could have been gone. Trust me. God can't use dead people, but God wants to use you. And every minute, every hour, every day we are alive, that means that the Lamb's book of life could have another name or two in it. It means that hungry bellies could have another meal or two. It means slaves could be freed. I believe you taking care of your health is one of the most important things you can do. It's not about vanity. It's not about self-confidence, although those are, you know, fine things. Vanity is really not, but you can live healthy to 100, but more importantly, you can live healthy today by making decisions. When's it too late to start a healthy lifestyle? Tomorrow's too late. You have to make these decisions. Live healthy to 100. Check out our booth or if you're on live stream, ancientnutrition.com forward slash Lance. We created these products for our families and to bless you. And with that, God bless you. I believe Lance is going to come right back. Powerful, powerful. Wasn't that... A stimulating download. You know, I was writing all these notes, and I'm furiously writing. I'm actually, I don't know how many notes you took. I was on the last page writing down supplements, lying me, and Mercedes hits me in the arm. She goes, you've got all the PowerPoints. <laughs> of course I do. I'm hosting the conference. <laughs> so you've got this. <laughs> Everyone gives you the material before they speak. I go, oh, I forgot. But I was like, I'm sitting in the same seat you were in, and I'm thinking, I didn't know a lot of this. And uh, how am I going to assimilate this and put it together? I'm thinking that, and if I'm thinking that, you're probably thinking the same thing. So step one is, I'm recommending to you speakers with expertise, and I'm a practitioner now with you. I'm learning with you. Every one of those products that he has Dr. Jordan has out there on the table, I've got at home and in my office, and I'm using them now. And I'm telling you, there's, a, there's, a, there's an impact that happens almost instantaneously. My son makes my coffee with that collagen powder that the doctor does with his wife every morning. That's how I do my podcast. I get that beverage, and, I, and I'm working with that. What I want you to think about is we're gonna take a 50-minute break, go out to the table, get a hold of the products, get whatever it is that you, you can do or need right now. But understand something. At some point, you're going to experience a little bit of information overload. Always ask the Holy Spirit, what's the one idea that I need to be hearing right now for me? Because you're, uh, you're going to be given a lot, but there's something in there that's going to be for you. Write it down. That's what you really need to be writing down. Because you can get like videos, you, you can look at this stuff. I don't know how we're doing that, if we're doing that for you. We should be able to recall this information. So you don't have to worry about getting everything. There's a way, to, there's a way that we can get this to you post so you can go back and look at it. But what I want you to do is think, Lord, what's the one piece that I need right now? Because we're not done yet. We got more information coming. And I need you to not uh, max out and like go tilt because you can't think anymore. So what I want you to do is I want you to stand up right now. Shake yourself out. I want you to say this with me. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to go to the next level. Next level energy. Next level strength. Next level clarity. Use your voice. Next level power. See, it's a little different now. Atmosphere is different. All right, you got 15 minutes. We're going to come right back. When you hear my wild music playing, get back in the room. Thank you. Welcome back. A mind-blowing session from Dr. Jordan Rubin. And I'm here with my friend Tommy Evans. Certainly not the first time we have done one of these together. But I want to encourage you guys, for those of you who are watching online, 
what Jordan was talking about, particularly the collagen, it is available. We're going to have information on the screen on how you can take advantage of this. But even in the break, I was talking to Tommy Evans. Now, Tommy, the Lord uses you and Miriam powerfully in signs, wonders, and miracles, but you guys are equally passionate about raising up a healthy body of Christ in everyday life. Yeah, the Lord really convicted us a few, a few years ago that you know we're body soul and spirit and we have we are temples of the holy spirit we've got to do something to take care of our temple we're responsible and so the lord just really convicted us just to begin to exercise to eat right to change our diet to get rid of all that processed sugar and the things that try to kill us and will kill us and cause us disease you know i was i've learned over the years reading and studying yep. that sugar actually is one of the number one root causes of all diseases and so, and those is, now we're not talking about natural occurring sugars, we're talking about added sugars, yeah. things like in, uh, you know, sodas and things like that, and, and, and different desserts and things. And so we just started cutting those things out. We started uh, just really getting out and moving more, walking, lifting weights, all of those things, cutting out certain things that are harmful for us. And I'm telling you, we begin to sleep better. We had more energy. Uh, we are we were able to go longer. And so I think this is a, something that we really, I feel like the Lord is trying to bring home is God wants us in it for the long That's haul. That's good. You know, the enemy can take us out yep. with all these things that we consume on a daily basis or things that we don't do for our health. And, and that's what he wants to do. The Bible says that he is here to try to kill us, to destroy us, and to steal from, from us. us. So he wants to take from us, and he'll do that through our health. Yep, yep. Well, it's interesting. They're talking about collagen, and a lot of what Jordan was talking about are things that you and your wife and your family have implemented. I mean, what benefits have you seen from doing that? Oh, my goodness. So, you know, we implement collagen every day. You know, there's different types of proteins. There's, you know, there's uh, plant-based proteins. There are, you know, bovine-type proteins. Mm. So all these are proteins. But collagen works totally different than any of those. Collagen helps with our hair, our nails, our skin, our joints, our connective tissues, and we need it to stay strong and healthy. And so Miriam and I, every day, we use it. We'll either put it in our shake, we'll put it in our coffee, we'll put it in one of our favorite drinks, and we'll just consume it. And I'm telling you, it really does. It really, we've noticed a difference in our complexion. We've noticed a difference in the way that we feel. So it's, a, it's an incredible type of protein that we all desperately need. Well, and the phrase you used is, God, I believe, wants us around for the long haul. And I'm even thinking tonight, when you join us this evening at 7.30, we're gonna do another healing and miracle meeting. But I believe what the Holy Spirit is going to do tonight, Tommy, you shared this a little bit with me, is it's wonderful to receive a miracle, and God wants to pour out yes. more miracles. But I believe God wants to use you Absolutely. to release miracles. And, I mean, we've done enough meetings together where we realize you need to be in a certain level of health or fitness to be somebody that's a vessel for the Holy Spirit. And I believe God's going to do that tonight, commission people. Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of our passions. Miriam and I love, love, love to activate the body of Christ, to move in the power of the gospel. The Bible says that Paul said this. He says, I don't come to you with wise and persuasive words, but I come to you with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith will not rest on us, yep. but your faith will rest in the power of of the Almighty God. And so we're going to be here tonight. We're going to activate people. We're going to commission people, release impartation. And if you're watching online, please share the broadcast to as many people as possible because we've seen people supernaturally healed online. We've oh, yeah. seen people uh, touched powerfully by God online. And so tune in tonight at 730. It's going to be absolutely incredible. Last thing, we want to encourage you to share your testimonies wherever, literally, even just the yes. process of writing it down and releasing it. If there's a chat, if it's on social media, I know we gave you an email. I think it was admin at lancewallnow.com. It is vital that you share your testimony for your sake, but also for the people who will read it and see it. And they will conclude if God could heal that person, touch that person, release a breakthrough, he can do it for me. Last question. I mean, how many miracles have you seen just come out of people sharing their testimony? Oh my goodness. I've honestly lost count. I mean, we've literally seen thousands of miracles and I've lost count yeah. um, as to many, how many miracles we've seen through the testimony. I mean, you look throughout history, the Bible talks about the testimony of Jesus is in fact the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. So when you share your testimony, 
it prophesies to someone else that what God did for me, He'll do it again and for mm. someone else. And we've seen this time and time again. You think about even revival history. Yep. A lot of revivals broke out because somebody shared a testimony of a That's revival right. happening somewhere else. And so why not the body of believers mm. change the narrative and our nation, the nations of the earth. You know, you get plenty of bad news that on right. all the news outlets and people are always talking about the negative. But what if we change the narrative, a God narrative, by sharing the testimony of Jesus? What would it look like? What would it do to people's faith? What would it do in regions and areas just by hearing what God is doing? It, it would shift things dramatically. And even as you're sharing that, Tommy, I want to encourage you, please don't diminish just what could happen with you writing down or sharing your testimony. Because I think sometimes people think, oh, I'm just putting it in a little chat or putting it in a comment, but you never know who will read it. Yeah, and you never true. know who, like you were explaining, that that testimony is literally like a prophetic word to that person yeah. saying, hey, Jesus healed me of this, and he can do the same thing Absolutely. for you. Absolutely. So we want to encourage you. We will be back in just a few minutes, and we want to encourage you to continue to open your heart, open your eyes to what the Holy Spirit is saying and doing, and in just a moment, we will re-pick up the live stream as we continue this amazing day of sessions.